Um, so my name's Diana Schaefer. I'm a specialty practice leader um, is my official title, but really what I'm responsible for is all of the nursing education on the inpatient oncology floors. And so I do a lot of the teaching in the day-to-day um, work on the floor. And I also coordinate with the outpatient clinic as well as um, the cell lab and coordinating cell products, including CAR T and stem cells and writing policies and making sure that all of the nurses are um, really just comfortable giving all of these new therapies. Um, I teach chemo classes, so lots of chemotherapy education as well. Um, but I've been at OHSU for 22 years now, and I spent most of my career um, on the floor as a bedside nurse and then transitioned into leadership um, six years now. So I've been doing um, more leader roles since then. But I love oncology. It's, it's, my, it's my jam. <laughs> Very good, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. So happy to, to have you join the team and welcome to the collaboration. And thank you, Richard, for for bringing uh, Diana to our group. And so, with that, uh, maybe the question again was to sort of ask. Maybe I think what Richard was asking is, what uh, are some of the needs, I guess, in Thailand to help Diana prepare for the trip in September? Is that right? Yeah. So I I, I will talk on behalf of the nurses first, and then maybe could uh, Jaren see me at some point and. Uh, and uh, Ajahn Vanapa can also add uh, some point. So I think your experience you, in your knowledge at OSSU is uh, very important and will help us a lot in, uh, you know, uh, get, uh, get to, 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 to improve our uh, nursing care for uh, transplant and CAR T uh, patients. So I think, uh, uh, Diana, you can, for example, for example, first give the general general information, general knowledge, and then give your uh, best experience based on your uh, realized experience on you know the inpatient uh, and outpatient taking care at your OS, and then question for some. Problems, for example, uh, EVHD, some uh, or uh, infection uh, prevention and uh, treatment, something like that. Yeah. So I mean, in general, keep the uh, principle and uh, translate your experience for infection. Uh, in special consideration for specific subjects, specific complications, specific point to us. Something like that, yeah. Kun anything to add, ha? Kun Palani. Chan, ha? And Diana, this is so, so great of, about your experience and i will uh, create a topic with jenny and uh, will approve by dr sulopon and we'll send you later what do you yeah, and again i'll say that it's more than just car t i mean she's you know diana has been probably at over between 150 and 200 car t infusions but also the treatment of grade four GVHD. She's seen all of what we've done for the years. Um, as you say, infections and sepsis, you know, the guidelines for how you identify sepsis early, you know, and how you teach that. I mean, I think these are all opportunities. Yeah. Uh, hi, Diana. Uh, my name is Dr. Pong Thon from BHRC, uh, the Mass Health Research Center. Um, but I also help in health uh, to develop uh, cell therapy business unit right now. So uh, when you come to visit during September, if I have a chance, I would like to uh, sit down with you to talk about 
uh, how OSH to perform cell therapy and what is your guidance, your direction, and how to set up uh, the basic labs or basic facility in order to prepare for that business unit in a very near future. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other comments? Okay. Well, should I try? Usually it fails when I try to like share, but let me just try and share. Um, otherwise, I think I sent it to Jenny. And do you see that? Oh, Justin. Can people see the slides? Yes. Yeah, 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 I can see your slide. Wow, it's like the first time. No, well done. <laughs> Good job. So I'm afraid to click the button to say from the beginning, but we'll just see what happens if I do that. But can you still see that? Yeah. Yes. Yes, sure. Okay, right, well then what I was gonna do is we were talking about like for this visit, um just gotta get my now I got to do my button next. Okay, um, is we're planning the part of it was the plan for the trip. The request was, is there any big updates from EBMT to discuss, or are there other meetings? I thought I would add EHA, ASCO, ICML, yeah, and then these other ones here is just are going to be part of future meetings that we talked about. Is how we have set up metrics for quality improvement. You know, again. Can we create a research proposal between our institutions? And also, what will definitely be part of the discussion in um, um, in September is follow-up of strategic plans. But for this one, I don't know. I probably will have a lot of information, and we'll never get through it all. So, But um, you guys will keep me honest for as far as the time goes. But what I, but I, I, what I put together is, I started to look at things I thought was important, and I started downloading slides from the different meetings that were available to download, and to put it together. Because even if I don't go through it all, you'll have it as a resource. But these are things that I think are practice changing, that at least in the, what we have, we're going to be dealing with at the United States pretty soon. But it gives guidelines to what you may also want to consider you know, going forth at your own site. First of all, one of the big ones, this was first, this was actually presented three months ago or four months ago and the tandem meeting, the ASTCT meeting. This was a late breaking abstract. So the data had just emerged for karma three, we're looking at Itacel. Itacaptogene viclucal is the product of, that was formerly made by Bluebird. It's now marketed by BM, Bristol Myers Squibb in the United States. And it was approved for you know, advanced myeloma beyond four lines of therapy. Uh, but what they're doing now for the first time is saying, can we do it earlier? And so this is testing Itacel. Karma 3 is a randomized trial against um, using Itacel early. So they recognize that triplet therapy is common. Um, quadruples are even now in the in our national guidelines if you have high-risk myeloma, they're even recommending four-drug therapy up front, adding daratumumab to, uh, you know, to a, tri a basic triplet. But what's happening is more and more patients are being triple-class exposed, antibodies, uh, proteasome inhibitors, and um, IMIDs at a much earlier time point. And so what we're finding is that for patients who are, you know, ultimately demonstrating resistance, we're seeing even now even a lower reduction, you know, average survivorship with less than 13 months. And so that's why CAR-T has been approved for beyond four lines of therapy. And so this is Idacaptogene. Again, it's the same CAR-T we talk about, viral vector transduction into autologous T cells, and it has a binding domain that sees BCMA, B cell maturation antigen. And they recognize that in heavily pretreated patients, like in the median, I believe the median number of lines was seven or eight lines of therapy in the original trial, 
that instead of a median progression-free survival of measured in like, you know, two to three months, they now had a median progression-free survival of nine months for very advanced patients, 73% response rate. And there was CRS, grade three to four CRS seen, but it was only about one in 20 people. And so the FDA approved it. So that was KARMA-1. Now we're looking at KARMA-3 as a randomized trial for patients who've only received two to four. So not in, so this is Ida-Captagene's approved for five lines of therapy as a fifth line. Now we're looking earlier. The study was ultimately screened 490. It randomized in a two to one ratio of Ida cell to standard. And there was, they were allowed, they dictated the standard regimens. So it was either DARA with pomalidomide, um, elotuzumab with pomalidomide, kyprolis, um, you know, or carfilzomib, and, you know, um, I, uh, Sarkluzy, which is the Sanofi antibody. So they, relate, they were referred, and ultimately, a number of patients were treated. And 225 were received Idacel, and 126 received standard therapy. The important thing to look at is immediately, you can see, is 100 out of 225, 158 are still on study. And out of 126, only 29 were on st still on study, suggesting that basically so over 70% here had progressed. Baseline characteristics were relatively balanced between treatment arms. They were high risk. You could see about 50% of the patients had high-risk cytogenetics and a variety of other high-risk features. A median range of therapies was three in both arms, standard of care, IDACEL, and the median range of prog on time to progression on the last myeloma therapy was about seven months. And a vast majority, two-thirds of the patients were officially listed as triple refractory. And so what did we see? We now could see that progression-free survival in the standard of care arm was 4.4 months on an intent to treat basis and 13 months on the patients who received CAR-T. And so, you know, overall, they predicted by a hazard ratio that it would say it's a 50% higher likelihood of, of um, living longer and staying alive. When you actually looked at responses, you know, this is the color code stringent complete remission and complete remission, you could see 38% of patients got to a complete remission. And most, many of these patients had prior auto transplants. Only 6% of patients with standard of care had complete remissions, whether stringent or CR. Why, if you add a VGPR to it, now what we could see is we're up to um, about 65%, but still only here, only about 16%. And of course, the PRs now, these are VGPR, brings you a number. So overall, um, really deep responses. And when you look at MRD negativity, there was 20% of patients were MRD negative versus 1% with the best triplet that was available. And as far as duration of response, like 80% of patients are responders. So now we're looking at the patients, the 80% of patients who responded to um, Ida cell versus the 25% of patients who responded to standard of care. For the responders, standard of care only lasted for about nine months, recognizing the vast majority didn't respond. And then, but it was now a median of 15 months. So a year and a half almost. So overall CRS was seen. CRS was seen at very, at only, it mostly grade one, grade two. Um, very easily treated with tocilizumab, very little need for um, advanced treatment. So in summary, this is the first randomized trial. This was presented in February of a CAR-T therapy against standard of care and with where it demonstrated a significant benefit with disease progression and survival. And it was superior in overall response rate and sustained response rate and the toxicity was acceptable. So this is, the, these are the first data to say we should use CAR-T at an earlier phase in myeloma care. So that's karma. That's for Idacel. So what else has happened in myeloma? Well, Novartis also presented at ASCO 
their own new brand new brand new drug. It's a brand new CAR T. It's called PHE 885. It's a BCMA targeted, just like Ida cells a BCMA target. But what they're going to say is they can really manufacture this much quickly. So vein to vein time, you know, vein of cells out and veins back in is going to be approximately 11 days. And what they do is they, they recognize there's now two competitive, two other drugs that are officially approved. And what they did is they said, we think we could be faster. And what they've done is they create a stimulation. They do the, they do the viral vector. They create the CAR T. They stimulate the cells. But it's less than 48 hours of official manufacturing time, at which point they um, plan to they start release criteria. And the goal is to get it back, because this is going to have the CAR T is going to mature in vivo. It's not in vitro. It's in vivo maturation. And there's, their goal is they think they can get from the moment we freeze a patient that we'll be reinfusing CAR Ts within 10 days. And so it's a multi-center, single-arm study, standard leukapheresis. So, you know, they get the standard lymphodepletion. And it was a dose escalation. And patients had to have had two or more therapies, two or more lines of therapy, and be demonstrating that they've had one of, they have to be triple resistant. You know, proteasome inhibitors, IMIDs, and antibody. You know, they had 60, 50 patients infused, median age of 65. Triple refractory was 94% of patients. Uh-oh. Has everybody lost my slides? Yeah, I cannot, I cannot see your slide. Oh, dear. Can you share them again, Richard? Just click the share button. Okay, where I didn't know if I, where's the share button? It says, um, hang on, let me find out that button is again. And so. Click back on the WebEx, the Cisco WebEx meeting icon and you should yeah, see. Yeah, I know. Do you have that now? Yep, it's back on. Okay. Thanks. So either way, so this is a new product. It's designed for rapid manufacture, minimal time out of body, and getting back to a patient within 10 days. Either way, what they found is a really rapid, very deep responses. On a dose escalation, they actually could show this is a very relatively low dose of 10 times 10 to the 6 CAR Ts that they had a 50% MRD negative response rate by three months and 70% at six months. So the responses continue. And so this is a phase one. They've identified 100% response rates. There was no unexpected adverse events. You know, no other late neurotoxicity. And they're now taking that to a multi-center phase two. OHSU is part of that. But the goal is, can they turn it around quickly? Now, the other one that just came out at ASCO, in the same way that Ida Cell said, we're going to look early. Well, Cartitude is the original study that looked at um, siltacabdogene, or what we call um, uh, Car uh, Carvicti. Um, this is the original trial was Cartitude 1, and this is for patients with very advanced disease. And what they're showing is that Cartitude 1 had a progression-free survival of, 50, of basically over two years, about 50%, and an overall survival of 70%. So Cartitude 1 data actually looks better than Karma 1 data. You know, I'm not saying one drug is better than the other. It could be patient selection. It could be eligibility criteria. But there was very exciting data about Cartitude 1. And this, so this was an update at ASCO. And I'm just going to go down here to the, you know, some of the, up, you know, the data is they're now looking at longer term follow up. And what they find is that two and a half years out, they have of the patients who responded, which was a, over 80 percent responded, two thirds of them were still without any evidence of progression. And at three years, um, the overall response progression free survival was 60 percent. So you know, very long-term follow-up, median hasn't been met for responders. And importantly, when you look at the patients at one year, they put a lot of patients into MRD negative status, and those patients were maintaining an MRD negative status. 
So the conclusions was that that Carvicti is the trade name or Siltacel um, is an effective agent with longer follow-up from the original trial that the median progression-free survival is approaching, you know, three years with an overall survival now at 60, over 60% 60 at three years, and that many patients can become MRD negative, and they will continue to follow it up. Now, what also was presented at ASCO is CARTITUDE 4. So I showed you CARMA 3. So they're doing the, the same thing with siltacabagine against st standard of care for lenalidomide refractory myeloma. Um, so the goal here, again, is for pay is comparing only this case. The If you were part on study, you were only allowed to do two, two regimens, either pomalidomide, Belcator dex or daratumumab pomalidomide and dex. And it was for patients who had basically had prior lenalidomide. And so you could have had only failed one line of therapy. So you got your standard upfront, you know, VRD, then you got an auto transplant, then you're on lenalidomide. And on first relapse, you could have been eligible. So it's a much earlier application of CAR T. Very similar. It's going to randomize the patients to standard of care versus CAR T. And they're going to follow the patients on over time in both cohorts. Baseline characteristics again, um, very met, they're very matched. Um, and I will also point out this was also presented at Ash at ASCO as a late breaking abstract. It was published simultaneously in June in the New England Journal of Medicine. And so, what was their what were their data? Well, the goal was you do you get them through trans you get them through the CAR T and there's a mandatory follow-up and um, and you look at the end of, with early application what's the likelihood of of having a response and you could see when you look at the median that standard of care was only about one year but the CAR T hadn't yet been reached and so the median progression free survival not reached and standard of care was 11.8 months so Again, we're seeing long sustained responses. Myeloma CAR, different than, than lymphoma CAR, has had a steady reduction over time, suggesting that we may not be curing people, but we are still can experience, um, but will they will experience relapse. Maybe we're getting a little sense there's a plateau. The important thing, though, is this is time off treatment. For those of you who manage myeloma or don't manage myeloma, Myeloma is about continuous care. Every patient who are in the standard of care is on therapy 12 months a year continuous. And so this does give a chance to free somebody up. Um, key secondary endpoints was, again, the rate of stringent CR was 58% with CAR or CAR-T versus 15%. If you did respond, the median 12-month duration of response was 85% versus 60% and much higher MRD negativity. Um, neurotoxicity was very similar. CRS and neurotoxicity were similar to what was expected. As of yet, there was no late neurotoxicities, no fatal neurotoxicities. And it does seem to be better and better tolerated with less toxicity than what you would have seen in patients with, um, with the six to seven lines of therapy. So the conclusions from CARTITUDE 4 is that the median progression-free survival was not reached with Siltacel versus less than a year with standard of care. There was a progression-free survival benefit across the board. Overall response rate was better, and that CAR-T adverse events were acceptable. And a lot of people think that this will be become a new standard of care, that we're going to be start to use CAR-T cell therapy, whether Ida cell with Karma 3 or Sicartitude 4, we're going to see CAR T for myeloma used at a much earlier phase in the relatively near future. So, briefly, the fifth, pre the fifth presentation I chose um, was about CLL. Now, we just had a, a four hour s session here with where we looked at review data of new trials coming. and. A number of the companies are not pursuing CLL. They don't see a market. Small molecules, 
you know, between BTK inhibitors, venetoclax, they're not ta tackling it. But Transcend is lysocabagine, Maricel, or Brayonzi the trade name. But they did have a subset of where they actually targeted patients with CLL. And this was the first data presentation at ASCO of refractory CLL. Um, they know that patients with very, very advanced CLL after both venetoclax and uh, you know, BTK inhibitors, that the likelihood of getting into remission was minimal and overall survival is limited. And so this is a patient that they're going to see, you know, what was the response with lysocabagine? This is in the original phase two trial that led to the approval of lysocabagine for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And what they showed is this is with a median follow-up now of a subset of patients with refractory CLL at 20, with a median follow-up of 21 months. So the study design, it's open label. Everyone we know we're getting, there's nothing blinded. Um, they did use the lysosol manufacturing strategy, which actually, when you send them fresh product, they separate CD4 cells from CD8 cells, and they manufacture each population separately. And then we infuse a set number of CD4 cells and CD8 cells, day zero. And so then, um, and this was a bit of a dose escalation where they wanted, because CLL, many of them have high, a high tumor burden, what they did is they dose escalate over two days. They didn't give it all at once. because They wanted to try and avoid those high risk, you know, the really very lice, the high lysis stage of, uh, that we could see with CRS, so it's divided over two days with the primary endpoint going to be remission. Again, baseline characteristics. Let's just look at the right side. This is, there was 117 patients overall, but 70 patients with the, the double refractory group. These are the ones that had a very poor survival. And you, know, you could see 100% um, were refractory to BTK inhibitors or venetoclax refractory. <laughs> they were bridged to, you know, on the way to between the manufacturer collection. And so well, how is the efficacy? So these are very poor risk patients. And again, if we look at the venetoclax failure rate group, you know, um, there were 18 CRs with 43% patients responding. 18, I'm sorry, 18% CRs and a 43% overall response rate. And in the blood, which is not necessarily bone marrow, but you're also getting a very deep um, measurable, you know, um, unmeasurable disease. So you're getting very deep responses in the responding population. So you can see our CRs and PRs added 20%. A lot of patients stable, but this is at early recording. And again, CAR T's may continue to clear over time. Median time to first response was one month, which is when you do your first detailed analysis with a PET CT scan and a bone marrow. And the median time to CR was three months. So again, we see progression over time. So this is what it looks like. If you take the CR population, you those patients, which is a small number, it's only 20%. This is the full study population. This is the refractory population. Those patients actually do very well over time with non-progression. If we look at patients who got CAR-T, who got a PR or near PR, you still got over two years of progression-free survival. When you start to get the non-responders, you know, they didn't necessarily do well, I mean, as expected, because it's a refractory population, but they probably weren't going to do well anyways. This is three months is probably what they were going to get with any best salvage therapy. So when you take the entire study population, the pro progression-free survival was 18 months, a year and a half. And this is for patients who were, had advanced CLL. And for the patients who were BTK and venetoclax failures, we have a median progression-free survival of one year. So excellent data for response rate and the duration of response. If you are a responder, a really good responder, the median hasn't been reached. And if you are a PR, it's like still two years. So responding patients do well. So I'm gonna to skip to the conclusion saying that 
This is a single phase two trial. They tackled CLL that a lot of people consider a very difficult disease. You know, you could take patients that have 80,000 white count and you're trying to purify CAR T cells out of that population. And it's just a difficult situation. But what they find is they have, uh, you know, excellent responders with a primary endpoint of complete remission of 18% when in this population we would have predicted 0% otherwise. And we saw good efficacy in all comers. It did appear safe. And they would like to suggest that Lysacel be pursued for evaluation for CLL. Next study, study number six. Um, and I'm going to take a break after this one and see if there's any questions. Then I'll go on to the next six. Um, is this is we talked before about Zuma Seven? Zuma Seven is the um, the study comparing CAR T versus chemotherapy and then onto auto transplant. So second line therapy for patients with relapsed refractory large B cell lymphoma, and so. We've already know now, it was published a year ago in New England Journal, that remission rates and disease control was better with early CAR T. Well, now we're looking at overall survival, and guess what? This presentation also was done at ASCO, and this presentation also led to a, a New England Journal paper that came out in June of this year. And so again, the paradigm here is we know in the past, for patients who relapse within 12 months a primary therapy for large re relapse of large cell lymphoma. So they're early relapse or they have primary refractory disease. Um, if your CR is less than 12 months, your median survival is short. And with, with some studies showing a 15 to 20, this is actually better. The Orchard study had a 25% two-year survival. Other studies show a 15% two-year survival. Importantly, there was the Zuma 7 original clinical trial, which was testing Axacel, Axicabdogene, in second line. And that trial was designed where patients were randomized. They, got, they were diagnosed with relapsed refractory large cell lymphoma within 12 months of RCHOP. They were randomized to best standard of care, or they were randomized to go as fast as possible to CAR-T. You know, they measured the responders and they measured non-responders. And this is not necessarily, it's important to recognize, this isn't comparing transplant versus CAR-T. It's comparing CAR-T against chemo and transplant. And what they showed is, oh, this was baseline characteristics were the same. And this was the number of patients randomized was equal. Um, when you identified that when you started, 168 patients were able to get salvage chemo, 178 or 172 were able to get lymphodepleting on the way to CAR-T. It turned out only 64 patients out of 179 were able to get to transplant. Only 36% got to transplant, 94% got to early CAR-T. And so, so almost 60% of patients had to go on to something else, which were basically off protocol CAR-T. So the failure, so Zuma 7 showed with event-free survival as the primary analysis that CAR-T was statistically more likely to be able to get you to a disease control state that would then contribute over time to survival. That was the event-free survival primary analysis. What was updated at ASCO was an overall survival analysis. Now they're saying, okay, if we go back here, we made these, these are the patients who were in chemo. They failed chemo. They never got to auto transplant. Well, maybe what happens if I rescue them with CAR? Maybe do I really need to do CAR T early? Maybe I could do CAR T later and I could still try to get people there. Well, what this data showed is that when you looked at a hazard ratio, it was almost 30% higher likelihood of being alive with oxycabagene versus um, chemotherapy and then being rescued with late CAR. So there was a difference with a median follow-up of 37 months. I mean, of 47, I'm sorry. There was a with 37 months, the median overall survival for the chemo group with getting then rescued with CAR was 31 months, but was not reached 
for the CAR T, and that was statistically significant. And if you take the people, these this is the patients who we know got um, now we're following over time that they responded. What about the patients who responded? You still get a survival benefit for patients who go to early CAR T. So this is now continuing to expand the paradigm shift where Axacel and Lysacel is also, their, their data is not as mature. Lysacel is also approved for second line, I will tell you, by the FDA. So Lysacel and Axacel, but these data now say clearly that overall survival is enhanced for patients who get oxycabinogen as first approach to relapse refractory large cell lymphoma, if and only if they were in the group of patients who failed um, primary therapy. So before I go on to the next slide, any I'm just talking out talking to a screen. Any questions for me? So <clears throat> thank you very much, Richard, for your very informative uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I. I can hear you. I was just saying, do you have any questions or should I just keep going? You, you. Okay. Uh, I think uh, in myeloma, you show that the the earlier you give uh, therapy, the better response we have. Yes. So uh, I think I, and I, that maybe uh, in the future we can use CAR T cell therapy instead of the autologous transplant, maybe for the high risk, high risk myeloma or in combination. Yeah, I 100% agree. And there are there are trials right now going on where they're taking those like P53 myelomas, the 17 deletion myelomas, or the, if you have two, you know, high risk abnormalities like a 14, 16, and a one chromosome one deletion, that they're actually looking at CAR T in first line. Mm -hmm. So these are, these are, these are right now, they're only research trials, but I think many of these trials are going to emerge and we're mm -hmm. going to have many, I think in cellular immunotherapy is going to like, you know, continually be used earlier and earlier in the management of patients. Mm -hmm. And uh, in patients who fail CAR T, CAR -T therapy, uh, what is the next treatment? Yeah, that's a good question. I think right now, um, so a lot of people are now, the big question is about bispecific antibodies. Mm -hmm. And bispecific antibodies, it turns out for BCMA cars, bispecific CAR T, I mean, a bispecific antibody seems to worsen your benefit of your CAR-T. But if you have a CAR-T, a lot of people are using bispecific BCMA antibodies afterward, you know, with some good results. Importantly, there's another new target for CAR-T for myeloma that's emerging. Um, it's the GPC-185 molecule. It's another myeloma mar surface marker. Um, Talquitamab is a bispecific antibody that targets the GPC-185. And now there's some new trials coming where CAR T, you know, targets that second molecule. So just like the CD19 CAR T failures in lymphoma are now being rescued with CD22 CARs, so I think we're going to emerge. We're starting to emerge to see that CD9 that we may have a second CAR T target for myeloma. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In in those who respond to CAR T therapy, how about the role of maintenance treatment? Great question. That's a big, that is a big question because should you be given maintenance therapy? Right now, all the studies that were done were done with the CAR T by itself. There is another research trial that's being a national United States trial where it's a small number of patients. There will be 40 patients who get CAR T and they're the high risk myeloma patients. And they are being recommended that when they get, when you're convinced that late cytopenias are resolved, because CAR T's have late cytopenias, they're actually going to recommend one year of rev low dose Revlimid. Now, that's another clinical trial we don't have the answer to. I, for one, right now, for the patients I treat with commercial, 
I did not add any adjuvant um, biologics, but it is something that is worth thinking about, especially for the patients with PR, not CR. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. All right, well, let me go on for a few more slides. Um, and by the way, whatever I don't Jenny's already got this slide set, so she can uh, um, distribute it like as requested. So one, I want to mention, this is an important study that came out. And it was presented at the EHA, the European Hematology Meetings. So, you know, the, with FLT3 inhibitors, we now know that if you have FLT3 ITG positive disease, induction therapy plus mitostore in the ratified trial has been shown to improve outcomes and improve overall survival. So there have been a multiple number, multiple trials comparing tra in transplant either single arm phase two or randomized trials asking about FLT3 inhibitor studies, you know, after FLT3 inhibitors after um, transplant. I, by the way, I didn't make this slide. We were just early, but the RADIUS trial was, I was the principal investigator of the RADIUS trial. And we showed that, you know, when you look at relapse rates, especially in patients that are responding to uh, mitostorin randomized versus standard of care, that there was definitely lower relapse rates. A lot of people, you know, this was, um, this was underpowered. The SOAR main study was randomized and had better power, and they showed a, a higher two-year re relapse-free survival. And that data is used to say we absolutely should offer part, or, um, FLT3 inhibitors after allogeneic transplant for, for um, FLT3 positive AML. So we were part of a you know, United States was it was United States, Japan, uh, Canada, and I think one other country. I think was involved in a study, an, uh, an international study um, called um, the Morpho study, which is using gilteritinib. Now gilteritinib is a it's a much it's a much cleaner. TKI, the mitostorin or serafinib, it is, it's more selective. It does, it's not as broad, like serafinib, there's six, about 60, there's 60 different serine th and threonine and tyrosine kinases that are inhibited by serafinib. So this is a lot less. And so the question, and it's also better tolerated, patients don't get nausea, they don't get sick like they do with serafinib. And so this was a study randomized for patients who went to transplant after with FLT3 ITD specific disease, and after engraftment, they're randomized to placebo or 120 milligrams a day of, of gilteritinib for two years. Now, initially they thought this was gonna, everyone thought this was gonna be a home run because this makes sense. It's a better drug in a lot of ways. Um, it's a more specific drug, it, it's, it's better tolerated, it turns out in the entire population, randomized patients, randomized 356 patients, there was really no statistical difference significant between uh, gilteritinib and placebo. However, however, and what they're going to show and what they presented is if you have measurable disease with, if you show by PCR a FIT3 signal, Prior to transplant, you have measurable residual disease, or even 30 days post before gilteritinib starts, that subpopulation of patients has a statistically significant benefit to adding a FLT3 inhibitor. And so this, these were data. This was a bit of a surprise. When everyone looked at you know, relapse-free survival and overall survival of the, the full populations, believe me, everyone was predicted there would be a benefit of the FLT3 inhibitor. Well, we didn't see it, but you could see, and they actually did the analysis. They presented this at EHA. If you did and look for MRD FLT3 expression or FLT3 by MRD um, next-gen sequencing, um, and you could show it in a panel, it was present right at the time of transplant, or you do your, give your myeloblative chemotherapy and you check at 30 days and you see you still have a FLT3 signal, and then you, you adding the gilteritinib was shown to have a much, was it enhanced, a statistically significant improvement in overall survival. If you're MRD negative at the time of transplant from your induction therapy or 
immediately afterward from your myeloablative application, there really didn't seem to be a benefit. So it's a positive trial and it's a negative trial. The original hypothesis is it was going to help everybody. In that way, it's negative. But now it's very positive. It's, it's helping us refine our ability to know how to treat a patient. So these data were presented for the first time publicly at the EHA meeting. Uh, it's not yet been published, but they will be, that will be forthcoming. Now, something I got out of EBMT, and I just have a one slide thing. I spent a number of, I, I, they had a special group called GoCart, um, and that's a, a European consortium to set up to um, create a collaborations across the different countries. They used the EBMT as a registry analysis, but what they actually did is this was an interesting study. So what happens if you have advanced lymphoma? Well, we know allogeneic transplant has been shown previously that even refractory large cell lymphoma in third line or fourth line, there is an allogeneic benefit in some patients can be cured. And what they showed then, analysis, this is retrospective, and they thought the patients were balanced. They went through the entire EVMT registry. And what they asked is, how many patients with refractory lymphoma went to allo? How many patients went to CAR-T? They looked and they declared that the populations were balanced for risk, except it was a younger patient population referred for allo, and an older patient population was referred for aught for CAR-T. What they showed is, Non-relapse mortality was increased with allo, you know, graft versus host disease, infection, organ toxicity. The relapse rate was lower than CAR-T with allo, but overall, the contribution, there was a slight de decrease, not statistically significant, a slight decrease in overall survival in the allo patients. Now, that was looking at all comers. They did a propensity matching, which which they basically pick the highest risk patients, and they say, I'm going to pick three risk factors or four risk factors, and I'm going to do a propensity score. I'm going to match those four risk factors in the group that got AL and those four risk factors in the group that got R. And what they showed is if you had a high IPI patient, you know, International Prognostic Index, CAR and AL were identical. If you had a low IPI patient, with multiple relapse, CAR was better than ALO, and overall the relapse rates were higher with CAR T. But over, so you, you may be sitting back saying, I can be very selective in how I um, would propose. For me, I've actually been thinking about this, which is what we ought to start doing is we talked about research trials. Is right now we're trying to think, well, what do we do for CAR T failure after ALO? And we're using, you know, we're using bispecifics, we're using immune conjugates. Nobody's really saying, well, let's go back to allo. And I think it's time to propose a prospective allogeneic transplant study multicenter to collect CAR T failure. Um, another, what time is it? 551. So this is, you know, Number, this is slide 64 of 95. So I'm doing pretty good to get through 64 slides so far. And uh, I, I have one question before we wrap up for uh, keep going. But there was a question that Jenny had sent around asking about some lecture material by email. I think you've already answered the question about flights. I saw the flights had come by, but there was an issue about chosen lectures. So uh, yeah. Dr. Surapon and Wanapa and Jenny, do you have answers to your questions right now for, uh, on this call for uh, for the team? I, I I think Dr. Wanapa, Dr. Wanapa already, uh, you know, answered your question. Okay, so you guys feel comfortable with the lecture content for the team ahead of time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so I think the question was, in the days that, the, you know, we're going to have the shared, you know, shared presentations where um, your team is going to show some, like, give some lectures and our team is going to give lectures. They right. were asking, I think we were asked for what our titles would be. Yes. And, exactly. You know, and I'd say... I haven't decided yet. I've given a number of lectures, and I've, you know, these are lectures, but I want to try and make something special. And, um, you know, I'm actually thinking of, I'm thinking of something. Um, but I think that's what, you know, Diana was asking, and she's going to 
But between us, Diana, Anita, and I, we will come up and send a what we think will be our, you know, our guidelines, our proposed lectures. I'm actually thinking about one, which is the history of GVHD therapy. Like, how did we get to what we are now? Because, you know, Dr. Sir Paul and myself are probably we remember some of the old days before calcineurin inhibitors. Right. And where were we and how far have we come in all, how much have we tried? A lot of the young folk don't really know what we know about graft versus host. And I thought a history of GVHD therapy might be was was is the thing that I was thinking about, but we'll do we will come together with plans. Good. Okay, thank you very much. And Jenny and Wanapa, let us know if we're missing anything while we have Diana and uh, and Dr. Richard on the uh, on the call. I think we are fine now. Um, anyway, just let I will wait for Dr. Shrapon to do the final, confirm, and then I should be able to send the agenda over to you guys to do, do double confirm. Okay, super. Okay. Thank you very much. Good, good. And thank you, Diana, for joining the call. Well, I have six minutes left. What I can do is I just think this is, I know that the, I just want to, I, I just, I want to get this out just because I think it's a very interesting study. And I know that this is a question that um, the group at BDMS or the group in Thailand is, is thinking about. What is, how good is allotrin, how good is CAR T for relapse refractory ALL? Mm. And for adults, not for kids. Mm. And so Zoom, Zoom with three is brextacabdogene, um, which is the, uh, product from Kite Gilead, which targets ALL. The difference between uh, brextacabdogene autolucil and axicabdogene is the same construct, but they will say they have a proprietary step that when the when they get the cells sent to them, that maybe it's maybe it's a depletion step, but something is done to the product before they start manufacturing CAR T. Um, but they have not just that's a company proprietary they have not disclosed it so when we look retrospective when we look at the old data for phase three for brexit cell and by the way this also led to fda approved um the treatment of adult patients with all there were 55 patients treated and from many many centers so in, in the data i'm sorry it was 55 patients treated with very good outcomes um, 70, 80 percent response rate. So where we are now is this is a real. What was presented at ASCO is a real world look. Now we're going to have outside of the clinical trial, you know, what is what are we seeing in adult ALL? And you can see OHSU is part of that real world analysis. Dr. Just Leonard was one member of my team members, and so this is a retrospective study. It's going to be enrolling people, and they're collecting data through the CIBMTR. And this is for patients not on trial, but who received commercial um, Brexacel, and it is for adults and above. And when you look at the patients, seven, there were 76 patients. The median age was 44. Um, a little, about close to 50, 50 female to male. The Philadelphia negative population was 70%. 30% was Philadelphia positive. 50% of the patients had prior blinitumumab, for 40% had prior inotuzumab, that's a bispecific antibody or immune conjugate, and nearly 50% had a prior transplant. Importantly, 70% of patients had active disease at the time of collection, and for patients who were in remission, there was only 12% of patients were MRD negative. So what did we see out of this population? Most of them had active disease, um, this is a toxicity, a lot of CRS, 83% um, of patients that had CRS, most of it grade one or two, 60% had ICANs. You know, here we see more advanced ICANs in the patients with ALL. If I look at response rates though, again, only 10% of patients were CR. Now we're seeing 90% of patients were CR at day 30 with 54% MRD negative, including patients who had had active CNS at the time of treatment. Um, when you look at duration of remission, at six months, patients who were MRD negative were 70, you know, they had a good chance 
So you're 180 days out, you test them. If they're MRD negative, they may remain free of disease, but if they're MRD positive, they're probably going to relapse and have a high relapse. They may need to, they may need something. If you ask for the patients who were in remission, um, who got no therapy, all comers, you can see that 60% of patients um, were stayed in remission. But patients, there were patients, they said, we better do a transplant on them. 80% were still in remission. But the vast majority didn't go to extra transplant. For progression-free survival, again, if you're MRD negative, very successful. If you're MRD positive after treat at six months, still a good percent of patients are going to relapse, but you can rescue them. If you never really had responsive disease, there's a good chance that you're not going to be, the disease isn't going to be controlled and you're not going to be alive. And that's what that shows. So overall survival, if you're not responder, is very poor. But if you could ask you, even the MRD positive patients, you could rescue and you could rescue with allo transplant. So in conclusions, of the patients who are receiving, adult patients with relapse refractory ALL, many with active disease, 90% of patients were in complete remission at early, including 84% MRD negative. That didn't mean it was sustained, but some patients were able to have it sustained. Patients with CNS disease could still get to remission, and that duration of response, and if you don't, if you don't want to consider an allo transplant, if we're MRD negative at six months, maybe not, but if they are MRD positive, and you were talking about using, most centers are using the um, next-gen sequencing clone seek assay, um, those are patients to consider. I th think I'm gonna stop there. There's another few extra talks, but gee, those slides are there. This is me just sharing my, what I consider high points from EBMT, but also EHA, ASCO, ISET, and ICML. And so at your own leisure, you can look at the last 20 slides. Thank you. Oh, well and, done, Richard. Yeah. Uh, may I have uh, one question? Yeah. Just So uh, I think treat, treat, treating a patient with fit three ITD positive AML is uh, uh, problematic. So uh, I, uh, the main objective of the uh, treatment is to get the MRD negative before doing transplant, is that right? Yes, yeah, so the goal is, so that's the goal is you want to be MRD negative. Yes. So, you know, the, 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 the brand new WHO, you know, the new classification, FLT3 ITD is also not necessarily a high risk disease anymore but very likely to be persistent. We're still recommending transplant for every one of them. Um, so um, this is the first trial. Again, the, the, the trials that were done before, that very set of slides, the RADIUS trial, the Sermain trial, the trial that was done from Korea, none of them tested MRD ahead of time. What we showed is if you got, they, patients seem to have a better relapse-free survival and a higher cure rate if you did transplant. If you did transplant and you put them on the TKI afterwards, this is different. This was a, this study. By the way, they didn't. It was blinded. We did not know what the um, we did not know the MRD status. They didn't share that with us. They collected the data, and they, they we just took them to transplant. But they did the the MRD testing, and so in retrospect. What we know is the MRD testing is, um, you know, what, what it's showing us now is if you're MRD positive at transplant, that's okay. You can still go to transplant and you, you could still become MRD negative at day 30. But if you're MRD negative at day 30, you are someone who absolutely needs a, um, a FLT3 inhibitor. If you, or if you're gonna use gilteritinib, you know, if you're MRD negative, you could say, I'm gonna wait and watch and just follow them, you know, molecularly and follow them over time. You know, if you wanna just give everyone serafinib, you know, just, you could follow the Sarmain trial, that would be okay. You could follow the RADIUS trial. We started everybody around day 42 to day 50 and continued for one year. Hmm. Do you think, now? 
Yeah, we use one year. Because mm -hmm. the reason, so the difference, so the trial, the, the, um, the Morpho trial and the Sermain trial recommended two years. The RADIUS trial recommended one year because at the end of the day, most AML, 80% of all AML relapses in the first year. And also foot three ITD positive disease tends to relapse even earlier. Many of it relapses by day 120. So for me, if I give one year of maintenance as adjuvant um, and there's no relapse, I'm fine with, I'm personally fine with stopping. It saves okay. a year of therapy. It also saves $250,000 to $300,000 of American money. I know. <laughs> So I've got to right. sign off. A quick question, uh, Richard. Could you make sure Dr. Nemechek works on her flights ASAP? We don't have her flights yet. Yeah, I promise I will. I saw that. I just showed that up in the chat. I saw the notes, yeah. and I will call her tomorrow. She, okay. I Thank talked you, to her last weekend. Okay. And she already had Kim's number and was going to talk to Kim. So I thought she was working on it, but I, I thought it would have been done by now. But I will reach out to her tomorrow. All right. Thanks, everyone. Great to see you all. Great job again, and be well. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, everybody. I look, and I Thank look forward to seeing you. you all again in person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Thank you. Up and clap.